Are we going to church? Yeah, right? John chapter 1, verse 29, speaks about the day that uh, John saw Jesus coming. John 1, 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We're going to see that phrase, behold. But this time, when Pilate says it, he's going to be saying, behold the man. We know, even here, John the Baptist sees, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Good morning, church. Welcome to worship this Lord's Day, guests. We are honored that you would choose to spend this time of worship with us. We want to say thank you for spending this time with us. We trust that you'll find our fellowship one that does seek to love God above all else. Uh, and out of the overflow of his love through us, serve others and go into the world to make disciples. We'd love to connect with you. You see ways to do that on the screen behind me, whether it's texting, whether it's QR codes, whether it's filling out the little card in your pew. We'd be honored to get to know you in that way. If you're interested in what's going on in our church fellowship, we do uh, have a digital way to do that. You can sign up for being in the loop. You can simply text the word loop to that same number or uh, fill out the or scan the code on the screen. We also have some calendars. If you weren't able uh, to get our October newsletter uh, through the email, we have some paper copies in the back that we'd be honored for you to pick up as well. As far as what's coming up, our homecoming weekend is coming up, and we have uh, a number of things beginning with Thursday night, fish fry for the men out at Jackie's house. That's at 6 o'clock Thursday, October 5th. Then Friday night, we'll gather together here for a family night. That's for the entire church family to come, bring a picnic supper, and just spend the evening together. We have some games planned, just some fun activities for the family. That is for the entire church family to spend that night of fellowship together. Saturday, we need your help serving our community at the Faith in Blue event. It's going to be over at the BMX Velodrome here in Rock Hill. I'm going to ask that you meet here at 12 noon on Saturday so that we can then ride together to the specific lot where we'll get our instructions from Lieutenant Johnson and his team at the Rock Hill Police Department. I talked to him this past week, and um, there are just two churches that have said they would help with this opportunity. Now, I recognize that it's a new thing for the city of Rock Hill, and so maybe they just weren't sure how to reach out to the churches, but we are one of two that said we would help. So I need you there. Uh, I need to know if you're coming though by Thursday. You can text me, you can use the text in church, you can call me, you can call the church office and say, hey, I'll be there on Saturday. Um, and so this is again, a whole church thing. You know, our church has had some negative publicity recently, again. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for us to show the community that we're here about the gospel and not about those things that are being brought back up in the media. All right, so this is an opportunity for them to see what the church is about. So I hope you can be here Saturday at noon, but let us know so that we can let Lieutenant Johnson know how many to plan on being there. Sunday then of the homecoming weekend, Sunday is our official homecoming day. We'll welcome Pastor Jay Repsiman, who will come and share one of his father's sermons with a fellowship lunch following the service. Our fourth through sixth grade equipped kids class worked real hard to, to get this flyer in your hands today. Um, we are excited about their desire to bless the Hope of Rock Hill, or the Hope, yeah, Hope of Rock Hill. Wasn't sure if it was Hope House, Hope of Rock Hill, um, as they want to bless them. If you didn't get one of those flyers, please see Sharon Neal or, or David Buchanan, uh, who can tell you a little bit more about it. But we're grateful that we get to worship this morning. And so as we begin this time together, would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word this morning. As we get to behold the Lamb of God. As we behold our King. When the crowd shouted crucify, we have come to adore. And so, Father, may your spirit come. 
and root out that which would hinder our worship today. For the sake of Christ, we pray all of this. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, church family. I'd love to invite you to stand as we sing together and crown him with many crowns. Thank you. 
be seated. Thank you. chapter 1. If you want to turn there, that's great. It's not where we'll be in our text necessarily, but it is important. Maybe you'd like to see it in there. Uh, that last line of the first hymn, I hadn't really sung those words before about the angels looking bent downward, looking into that mystery. And then we just sang about it again in that song. So I thought it appropriate to show you where that is in the Word. Those aren't just meaningless words on the screen. They are found in the Word of God. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, let's, let's start with 10. Concerning this salvation, this salvation that you just prayed, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when, indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. This is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times that we talked about in our message. Okay, we're talking about the same Peter, right? Twelve. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. The angels don't understand our salvation. There was no need for those angels who stayed on God's side to know salvation like we know it. They can't fathom in their wisdom. It's not equivalent to God's wisdom, but they are wise, and in their wisdom, they can't fathom why their beloved Father would go to such great lengths to reach us, sinners. They long to look into that. That's amazing. So, we study, we're in John, finishing up chapter 18. Think about that. Think about, as we finish up 18, get into 19, think about this salvation that we're talking about that's, that's happening in this text. The angels scratch their heads and think, I, I can't believe this. Father, as we take the truth of your word today, I ask that your spirit would multiply the words that come out of my mouth so that it's your words that are spoken to us. That we would receive it with great joy. And that we too would continue to long to look into the gospel. The gospel is not the elementary teachings of Christianity upon which then we can dive deeper into Christianity. The gospel is that which we dive deeper into and find that there is no bottom. And so today, give us eyes to long to know more of the King. For those who are here today, Father, who may not know you, you drew them here. It's not an accident. I pray that today they would be moved by your spirit to see the goodness of God and be able to declare that you are the King of Kings. For those who are here today who, who maybe they, they made a profession of faith, they trusted in you at one time in their lives, but they recognize that, that they haven't been obedient to what you've called them to do. They've walked along the ways of the world instead of the, the narrow path uh, of life. And then I pray that today there might be repentance and a renewal to 
four-year phase. For those who are walking strongly today, strongly walking by faith, putting aside all foolishness, false teachings, all of that, they're, they're walking obediently with you. I pray that they might be strengthened and encouraged and challenged as well. We love you, Father. And we praise the Father, and we praise the Son, and we praise the Spirit. Come now, please, Spirit, and teach us. In the name of Jesus, amen. If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. That's the best news the Jews could come up with as to why they were pushing for Jesus' arrest and crucifixion as Pilate questioned their motives. Now, Luke fills in some of the details that John chooses not to tell us about, but the accusers went before Pilate and said that Jesus was misleading the nations and forbidding them to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now, last week, we talked about the inside-outside nature of, of this drama, and that sort of continues today. As Pilate goes back into his headquarters, remember he doesn't necessarily always reside here. He's here visiting. It's a time of great festival in the area. And so Rome said, you better have somebody on site. So he goes back into his headquarters and it's the part about a king. That's the part that seems to have caught Pilate's attention in all of this. And so let's look. John chapter 18, beginning in verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? That's the question. Are you the king of the Jews? It's the first of many questions that Pilate demands to know in this interrogation scene. Other questions follow. What have you done? So you are a king? What is true? Where are you from? Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and to release you? Shall I crucify your king? The more we consider Pilate's questions, the more we realize many of his questions are questions the world still wants to know today. What has Jesus done? Is Jesus the king? What is truth? Where was Jesus from and does it really matter? The answers to many of Pilate's questions led him to boldly present Jesus to the angry crowd with the announcement, Behold the man. And I wonder if he understood all that he was saying when he made that statement. And I can't wait for us to get there. We'll get that in a little bit. But, but all of us, church, are called to behold the man. To behold the Son of God who took on flesh so that we might live to pursue and recover God's original design. But Pilate didn't start with calling the Jews to behold Jesus. He needed to learn some things about Jesus himself. So let's get back to Pilate's first question. Are you the king of the Jews? Now, having an earthly king, if you remember, was something that the Israelites longed for as they looked around and, 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 and saw the supposed benefits of someone to go before them in battle, someone to represent them at state functions as other nations around them had. And it looked like the other nations enjoyed that. Now, the Israelites didn't need a king because they had God. He governed and defended them, but they still longed for an earthly king. And even after they were warned of what having an earthly king meant, the people still cried out for a king. That's okay, they said. We still want a king. Well, God granted them their desire, gave them Saul. He wasn't great, but after him came their beloved King David. He was a man after God's own heart. But after him, the history of Israel was filled with more wicked kings than good ones. 
The nation ultimately split up, proving their desire to be like all the other nations around them was rather disastrous. Now, that doesn't mean God didn't have an idea for them regarding a king. You see, long before Israel asked for a king, God promised a future king who would rule over all the nations, establishing an eternal kingdom. We don't have time to go there today, but in Genesis 49, as Jacob gathers his sons to him to bless them before his death, he gives this prophetic blessing that in that blessing, there was an expectation that a king from Israel was going to rule a world worldwide kingdom. Numbers 24, 17. You find it again. Balaam's prophecy. Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Samson. They're leaders who don't ever become a king. The book of Judges ends with that sad refrain. There was no king in Israel. But by the time you get to David, many wondered, okay, many people understood the prophecy of Genesis 49. They, they had that. They could look to that. And so they knew that God was promising this future king who was going to rule the world. And so as you look at David, he looks like he could be that king. He was from the line of Judah. He had great military success. Well, it seemed that he might have been that promised king. He wasn't the one either. But the prophesied king was going to come from David's line. He'll be the son of David and a son of God. Well, when you cross over into the New Testament, when Jesus begins his public ministry, calling his disciples one of them, overwhelmed by Jesus' knowledge because Jesus mentioned, I saw you under the tree. Overwhelmed by that knowledge that somebody could know where he was sitting, he says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Now, Jesus didn't correct that disciple. He didn't say, oh, no, don't talk about me like that right now. He didn't correct him. He simply assures him that he'll see greater things than he'd been shown so far. Well, Pilate's about to learn greater things as well. Jesus' response to Pilate's question actually puts Pilate on trial. You see, what Jesus is doing here is he's completely in control, is wanting to get to Pilate's heart. Look at 34. Let's, let's keep reading. 34. Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. we got to keep in mind, during Passover time, messianic expectations were running high. The idea that maybe the Messiah was going to come now during this Passover season brought people, brought excitement, Okay, so no Roman governor wanted the higher ups to hear of trouble in their region. So if you had this claim of a king being in the area, that could stir up trouble leading to an insurrection. So Pilate wants to know, are you the king of the Jews? In other words, are you threatening my authority around here? Now, as far as trials meant, Jesus knew that evidence couldn't be based on hearsay. So Jesus questions Pilate. Remember, Jesus is in charge. He says, are you asking this question because of hearsay, or do you personally consider me a king and want to know? It seems like a random question. But remember... Jesus, even in all of his sweaty garments from that night in the garden, even after his being bound and slapped and mocked, this is the one who is the word in the flesh. Let's not forget that. 
God in the flesh is standing before his creation and he asks Pilate a probing question about kingship because Jesus still cared about Pilate. He's calling on Pilate to think. He's saying, Pilate, based on what you've seen so far about me, what do you think? Do I appear to be different? Don't just take what they say. It's interesting often how things work in God's economy. There seems to be this reversal of appearances. The meek rule. The poor are rich. The, the, the weak are actually strong. And in this moment, defenseless Christ in his flesh, in a sense, is holding court on Pilate. <laughs> Behold the man who is in control. Now, Pilate just blew off Jesus' words and retorted back that he wasn't a Jew. He didn't care who led the Jews, but Pilate presses, what have you done? But Jesus wasn't finished addressing the king part. He knew where the rub was, and he had no trouble going there. Jesus speaks of his kingdom, identifying himself as a king, but not of a kingdom that was any threat to the Roman Empire. Jesus' kingdom is not from this world. It didn't originate here. It isn't bound by the limitations of earth. Remember Jesus' prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now this doesn't mean the earthly realm doesn't matter. It just means that he doesn't, that, he, that it, the, the world doesn't have any authority over him. He does have authority here in this world, but it means that his kingdom is greater than this world. The priorities in his kingdom are different. The experiences in his kingdom are beyond words. And while Jesus' servants could take up weapons to halt the crucifixion, those were not his orders. As a spiritual king, Jesus has servants that he protects. He doesn't need protection from them. As a spiritual king, the weapons of his servants aren't swords and shields. For a spiritual king doesn't rule by material force. As a spiritual king, Jesus wasn't trying to establish a kingdom by force. So the Romans had no reason to believe that Jesus was trying to lead a rebellion, no matter what the Jews told Pilate. Now for believers, knowing that we're part of Jesus' kingdom means that we don't take our instructions for how to obey him from the world. We get our instructions, we get our marching orders from the word. The word of the king himself. And that means that we often feel out of step with the world around us. It's normal that we don't cheer on many of the things that the world celebrates. It's normal that we're often left out of public conversations. It's normal that you may be overlooked at work because you can't subscribe to the diversity, equality, inclusion initiatives. It may be. And after a while, the struggle, feeling as though we're constantly swimming upstream from culture, gets wearisome. It does. And it makes us potentially want to give in. We can't give up and decide to swim downstream. We also can't take on the task by ourselves of trying to change the tide of culture on our own. We must trust God for strength to keep swimming and give our lives to the Great Commission, making disciples of all nations, inviting others to know the joy of Christ, that they might know the joy of Christ and joining us in living lives that reflect our citizenship of another kingdom. Friends, the progressive culture knows that if they can normalize their behaviors in children, they will win a generation. That's why the older saints must be pouring into midlifers, and midlifers are pouring into young adults, and young adults are discipling their own children, but young adults are also pouring into teenagers, and teenagers are pouring into children. This was God's design. It's not a program that Lifeway put out to grow your church. Is in, this is how it's supposed to work in the Bible. I heard just this week from a sociologist, about an article, sociologist over in the UK. The churches that aren't growing, this is interesting, the churches in the UK that aren't growing aren't those that require less of their members, but require more. 
Those churches that expect their members to commit to agreed upon doctrine and covenant to do life together are thriving, while those that follow the ways of the world are languishing and may no longer exist by 2040. That was a report just this week. Mr. Hitchens, right? not Christopher Hitchens, but potentially of that same line. Christopher obviously is a, a popular name or a name in, that you might know of. But um, this Mr. Hitchens looked at two different churches. One was the Pentecostal church, and he said, I went in, he did his research. He went in, he said, on the back wall, I guess he probably meant this wall, there was a cross. He went into the United Reformed Church of England, and on the wall was this tree. And the tree had little bits of fire and stuff that was supposed to represent, you know, purity and peace. He listened to this United Reformed teacher, it was a lady, and she stood up there in the pulpit and, and said, you know what? I just don't even talk about pronouns with God because, I mean, he's so other, you know, what, what pronoun could we use to talk about him? And I'm thinking, the pronouns he gave us in his word? <laughs> Those are what we do. Those are what we use. But Mr. Hitchens said the, the fuzzier you start to make God look, the more people start to say, well, I don't need to go there for that. And they're saying by 2040, some of these churches in the UK will be gone. But the ones that are thriving are the ones who say, this is who God is. This is doctrine. And this is what it means to be part of who we are. Isn't that interesting? Because the world lies to us and says, oh, just be seeker sensitive and, and just be all things to all people and your church will be full. No, it won't. That now tells us that it will not happen. Those churches that actually hold people accountable and ask people to think are the churches that will thrive. We're not of this world. We live, those of us in Christ, we live for a different world. We are adopted children of the King whose kingdom is so much greater than this world. It was that word kingdom that sort of continued to swirl around in Pilate's mind based on Jesus' comments. So you are a king? Retorted Pilate. Jesus acknowledged his royal mission, but he spoke plainly that he had not come to take over the world by force. Pilate had nothing to fear. Jesus came to make plain the truth of God, the truth that there is a spiritual kingdom. Jesus is making clear, I didn't come here for military world domination. I came here to make the truth of my father known. And everyone who recognizes the spiritual nature of Jesus' kingdom and seeks it, hears Jesus' voice. Christ calls a very materialistic world to find satisfaction in his kingdom. But the trouble is, the world really wants an economic savior. Think of it like this. After Jesus fed the 5,000, the people went away full. But you know what happened next? They asked Jesus to give them some more bread like Moses had given the people. Just keep meeting our physical needs, Jesus. Jesus explained physical bread would only leave them looking for more. They, he said, you should seek the living bread. Oh yeah, I'm all for that. Give me some living bread. And Jesus said, I am the living bread. Come to me. Find satisfaction in me. But that wasn't what the people wanted to hear. They walked away, choosing to remain bound in their fleshly lusts instead of finding life itself. Church, you and I are invited to behold the man who calls us to hear his voice as that of truth. Now, Pilate wasn't interested. Just as the multitudes had no desire to come to Jesus for life, Pilate had no interest in coming to the one who bore witness to the truth. Look at what he says in verse 38. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. The world struggles with that same question. What is truth? So while Pilate didn't seem too interested in really getting an answer, it would do well for us today to consider the question. 
When we say that something is true, we're saying it conforms to reality or to the facts. But in order to know this, there has to be an external standard to measure whether or not the stated information conforms to reality. When we're talking about the truth of God, the standard is this, his word. So here's five characteristics of ways we can define truth. Number one, truth is objective. Truth is objective because it comes from God and is independent of us. This is made of wood. No matter what you might think, oh no, pastor, it's made of glass. I can see right through it. No, pastor, it's plexiglass. No, it's wood. Okay, we can test it. There are methods of testing what this is made of. All right, so truth is objective. Number two, truth is absolute. Because God alone is God, and his authority is fixed and immovable. We can know absolute truth. There are formulas. I don't see Mr. Frank here today. Maybe he's somewhere else. But there are formulas to get his plane off the ground. If you choose to reject those formulas and say, ah, I don't think so, I'm going to go with this formula, guess what? That's a problem. You might not get your plane off the ground. Truth is absolute. Number three, truth is universal. Because God is over all his created universe and all things and people in it. So his truth applies to everyone everywhere. Young, old, men, women, rich, poor, U.S. and around the world. Truth is universal. Number four, truth is unchanging. Because God will always be God and his perfections never change. Psalm 33, 11, it is something that you can depend on because it won't change over time or be rejected because of new discoveries. It's unchanging. We don't have to be afraid that AI is going to uncover something that's going to eventually say, oh, see, there is no God. It's not going to happen. As smart as AI is, it's only as smart as the programmers who put the stuff on there. Truth is knowable, number five, because God communicated his truth to man. We can know it. He's done it most clearly through his word. It's not hidden. It's revealed and communicated to us. And so while the world feeds us lie after lie, and each lie seems to be getting bolder and bigger over time, Jesus speaks the truth, de-arming the father of lies. Jesus says you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yes. Jesus didn't come to advance his kingdom through military might. He came to offer salvation through the message of truth. Christians serve the king well by constantly feasting on the word and bringing people to the word to find hope and healing and freedom, reminding one another what the king said and not simply offering common sense or other worldly solutions. Friends, before we Google how to help a hurting friend, go to the word. Go to the word. Before we become anxious about the ways of the world, we go to the word of truth that reminds us of our future. Pilate was beginning to understand that Jesus was no threat to social order. And so he went back outside and he made that important statement, I find no guilt in him. So this very public figure, this man of great authority, just admitted that he couldn't find any fault in Jesus. None. He's going to say it a few more times to make a point. There was no sin in Jesus. He wants to close out this trial pretty peacefully. Pilate, remember the Jews had this custom of releasing someone during their Passover celebration. It was a symbolic act to remember God's merciful deliverance from Israel's bondage in Egypt. So in Pilate's mind, aha, like Paul, I've got a way out of this mess. Notice Pilate's wording. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Was he stoking the fire or claiming something he was beginning to realize? Look at verse 39. He says, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Does he see something else? Is he starting to, to, to recognize something? Well, we can't say. We don't know. 
But knowing that he was trying to end this before it went any further does seem like he was seeing something in Jesus that he'd never seen in a prisoner before. <coughs> oh no, shouted the crowd. Look at verse 40. They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Interestingly enough, Barabbas means son of a father. Son of a father. So, look at the irony. The Jews are trading the son of a father for Jesus, the son of the father. Now, surely the, the people would want Barabbas killed. The text here says Barabbas was a robber, but other gospels help us see that you could best describe Barabbas as a terrorist. Barabbas was the kind of man that the people were claiming that Jesus was. The kind of man who didn't want your daughter bringing over for Easter lunch, for sure. Pilate's plan, however, backfired. They wanted Barabbas released. So Jesus, even in this mockery of a trial, became the substitute for a despised rebel so that he might go free. I'm not saying he was saved eternally. But he was able to be set free from this imprisonment and this impending death. Barabbas could say that he was the only man who Jesus took his physical place. Believers can say Christ took our spiritual place because we deserve the wrath of God. And yet Christ bore it for us. Behold the man who takes the place of our dark, rebellious hearts. This really left Pilate with no choice but to come up with another plan. <clears throat> this time, it was going to be to flog him, to scourge him. Maybe, he thought, if Jesus were whipped and beaten to near death, the people would have pity and relent. Let's pick up in chapter 19, verse 1. And Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail! king of the Jews, struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Scourging, flogging. It was an awful ripping away of the skin. It was purposefully meant to expose the bones and basically leave the internal organs hanging by their blood vessels as life slowly ebbed away. One can almost imagine seeing his heart literally beating in his chest. Seeing it because all the flesh was gone. Intestines starting to unwind and hang to the ground. Many people died just from the scourging. Some people lost their minds. The, the, the trauma just overwhelmed their mind. The soldiers seeking to really add to, the, to their joy, right? They want to poke fun at this Jewish king. They didn't care who it was. They thought that a crown and a royal robe would add to the dramatic entertainment. But it wasn't just any crown. It was a crown of sharp thorns mashed onto his head. Now the symbolism here is amazing. The sin's curse in the garden. Do you remember what it brought to the ground? It brought thorns and it brought thistles into the world. So it was fitting then that the creator wear a crown of thorns as he bore the sins of the world on the cross. Pilate uh, goes out to address the crowd prepping them for what they're about to see. And he makes his second declaration of Jesus' innocence. There must have been a gasp. <gasps> Jesus came out from the headquarters. Isaiah actually tells us what he looked like. Isaiah 52, 14, his appearance was so marked beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. He didn't even look like a human anymore. And Isaiah talked about that hundreds of years before it happened. One can almost imagine the taunts. Is this the man you're all worked up about? Look at him now. What a pitiful fellow. 
Yet Pilate's declaration, behold, the man is truly overwhelming because this is the second Adam. This is the only one who could reverse the curse and he was standing before them. The man was standing in their presence. The man that we were supposed to be had not sin entered the world full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God had become a man, stepped into our world, and this is what he looked like. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God, the only God who's at the Father's side. He, talking about Jesus, has made him known. Jesus is the true human. He's the perfect human. He's the image of God. So don't let the behold the man just wash over you. This was who we were supposed to be in this world. And he's standing there all guts and everything else hanging out. Pilate's plan got him nowhere. The people only seemed to be more enraged. Look at verse 6. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take it yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. There it is. Pilate said it a third time. He found no guilt in Jesus. Why does that matter? Because three declarations mean something. The number three often represents something superior to the highest degree. Why do the angels say, holy, holy, holy? Why not just say it one time? Because to say it three times is to say it to the highest degree. And so here's Pilate, this worldly ruler, saying three times, I find no guilt in him. Jesus is completely innocent. The judge of the earth declaring the sinlessness of Christ. And all the people could do was shout, crucify! Why such hatred from these leaders? Well, because Jesus challenged them in what they held most of the earth. Their facade of religious superiority. Their artificial authority actually governed through guilt and fear. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus came to teach freedom from guilt and fear. Jesus didn't come to push religion down our throats. He came to offer us the gospel, God's free gift of grace. Religion just changes the outside, the appearance, not the heart. The gospel takes a shovel to the heart and starts digging out all the muck and the filth. It isn't pretty because sin is ugly. Just behold the man. Sin is ugly. Behavior modification or reform doesn't work. If we attempt to change through religion, that is through what we do, things like church attendance or charitable giving or disciplined living or strict, moral, strict moralism, we may succeed in putting a fresh coat of paint on our outsides, but the inside of our heart would still be like a big sty. But the gospel, but God, the gospel offers us a heart transplant. The gospel doesn't whitewash over sin, but expels it. Now the angry crowd heard Pilate declare Jesus' innocence. For Pilate to crucify Jesus now would be heaping damnation on himself for killing an innocent man, but the crowd wasn't moved. Look at verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law. According to that law, he ought to die because he's made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. The Jews knew that Rome wouldn't kill Jesus over his theology. They didn't care. So they made up a charge of sedition. But when that didn't work, they basically said, look, we want you to do our dirty work because our law prohibits people from making themselves equal with God. He needs to die. You need to do it. That's what they said. Here, verse 9. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you'll not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Pilate was in deep now. He'd seen the Son of God standing before him, and now he's reminded of Jesus' claim. 
We can imagine Pilate's head just spinning with more questions. What if he was from God? What if what my wife said was right and I shouldn't have anything to do with this man? <laughs> Frustration, Pilate says, where are you from? To which Jesus doesn't answer. That enrages Pilate even more. So Pilate pulls the authority card. In this moment, Jesus before Pilate, with his blood gushing and guts hanging out, was actually the only free man in the room. All the power resided in Jesus because Jesus was the only one in that room who could do as he pleased. Pilate wanted to release him in a bad way, but he couldn't. Jesus' heart was such that he wanted Pilate to behold the man. Jesus' authority was real. Pilate had real authority too, but it was delegated authority. God purposefully placed Jesus at Pilate's mercy to accomplish his will. It's as if Jesus were saying, go ahead and do what you're going to do, Pilate, because you're doing the will of my Father. And Jesus even offers grace to Pilate. He says, your sins aren't as heinous as those who delivered me over to you. The Jews had the Old Testament pointing to a coming Messiah. Their betrayal of Jesus into the hands of Gentiles was a horrific sin. Pilate was a spiritually blind pagan. Caiaphas and his buddies knew better, so they committed the greater sin. Pilate was at wit's end. People could tell he was waffling, so they pulled one final card. Look at verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. See, that's, that's what he's trying to do. But really, he's powerless, right? I thought he had all authority. I thought he had the power to crucify or to release. No, he doesn't. Here's what the Jews say. If you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Pilate was just talking about his authority, but now we see his authority was halted at the mention of Caesar. If you're in Pilate's place and you wanted to keep your job and probably your life, you didn't upset Caesar. Caesar was a recluse. Don't offer an island. But you didn't mess with him. He made sure you didn't. Upward mobility in Roman life meant that you maintained close ties to Caesar. If you were a friend of Caesar's, there'd be no room then to put up with a man who calls himself a king. And that very challenge pushed Pilate over the edge. Read verse 13. So Pilate heard these words, not the words that he might be a son of God. That got him unsettled. But Pilate wasn't so concerned about whether there was a God, he wanted other mobility. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and an Aramaic Gabbat. Now it was the day of preparation for Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. Notice he changed the word there. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. Pilate sits down in the judgment seat and makes one last ditch effort to sway the crowd. You know, his supposed authority. But instead of behold the man, he says, behold your king. Their hatred continued. Pilate asks his last question. Shall I crucify your king? Their rejection of God meant they boldly lied or they conveniently forgot that God was their king. And at that Pilate, yielding to the authority granted to him by our Father, turned him over to be crucified. Behold the man. The first time he came, he was a humble king, laying down his life so that we might be spared the wrath of God and brought into his kingdom. The next time he comes, he will be coming as a victorious king. 
Establishing his eternal kingdom. So when we take in all who Jesus is and commit to him to live our lives as he is king, our lives will change. We'll see the direction of our lives change. We'll push hard to accomplish his mission using our time and our talent and our resources to carry out the king's command. We get to go to the nations and tell them that death is defeated. Shame has surrendered and Jesus is king. Father, I, I rejoice in your kindness in sending your son. <coughs> To rescue us from our dark, twisted, messed up hearts. And I thank you that in your power, you can silence the lies that might be feeding our soul. And you can speak to us in truth from your word. God, it is right to behold our King. Not just in here, but as we go out into the world to be the church. We would make the goodness of our King known. That our lives would reflect that we serve a different King. That we're not afraid to speak up for truth. God, I pray for our, our teens that are and our children that are being fed lies in their curriculum. I pray that they be able to discern that. And love their instructor and love their peers well who may still be blinded to the truth. this place, hailing the name of Jesus, beholding our King. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, church, and consider the King. Allow the words of the hymn to, to paint a continued picture of this King that we adore. Sing with me if you would, church.
say Revelation 7, 14. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For He is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called chosen and faithful. Love, sir. Thank you.